Welcome to Hammered in Helios, a 5th edition spirited Dungeons and Dragons homebrew campaign. During each session, our cast not only tries to survive the cool Dungeon Master's plans, but also reviews a delicious bottle of liquor. Remember, whether you're adventuring through a fantasy world or just listening to ours, please drink responsibly. Hey everybody, Owen Landsberg, your evil, cruel, malicious, but lovingly tender dungeon master here. This is Garrett Carty, uh, and I play Ignath Redjaw, your orc ranger monster slayer. And this is Brando. I used to play Croft, a human rogue. Now I play Victor and Amber Hall IV, a human rogue. We've got a fun little episode here for you guys. This podcast is actually starting roughly 15 sessions into our campaign. So we decided that we get a couple of us here together and just kind of go over the story so far that has happened to the heroes. You know, all the peril, all the mischief, all the torment that I have put them through for these past 15 sessions before the podcast. Without further ado, here is the story so far. The city of Seraph is the largest city in all of Helios. It's a port city nestled in the Wing Peninsula of Peleos. Its buildings are white marble and trimmed with ruby red. As they tower over the ocean, it's truly a sight to behold. But Seraph, just like the rest of Helios, is under the rule of the Chains of Emrius, a totalitarian police force that patrols the world, enforcing all of Emrius's decrees. Seraph is home to one of Helios's most popular taverns, the more often than not. Once a caravel ship that sailed the seas, it has now become permanently docked and repurposed into a tavern. Still strangers, our four heroes sat in different parts of the room, eating and drinking. However, fate had something else in mind. With a sudden burst, the saloon doors swung open. Rao Glorin, a human male wearing a blacksmith apron covered in suit and blood, Hair as brown as the earth and eyes sky blue, hunched over, was grasping for air. Ral screamed for help. His daughter had been kidnapped by Knowles. He attempted to fight them off, but was only able to kill one before they knocked him out. When he awoke, his daughter Devana was gone. Of all the adventurers and heroes in the more often than not, Anesson, Ignath, Orin, and Croft were the only ones who offered to help. Ral told them that his daughter was only 15 years old, had vernant green eyes, and hair as black as the night. The heroes then went on a hunt to find the Knolls and to save Ral's daughter, Tavana. This took them on a four-day journey outside of Seraph, through the Jagged Woods, and even to the base of the Relin Mountains. The Knolls had taken over an old bandit hideout called the Knights of Yarantar. Yarantar was a female orc who led a small force of warriors who believed that Emrius was an evil god and needed to be stopped. After dispatching a small patrol of Knolls protecting the old building, the heroes headed down into the hideout. The first room had five statues in it, one of Yarantar herself, and the four other were of her lieutenants. Clench, a Luxodon monk, Alden Brownbottom, a halfling warlock, Kelikolo Sua, a trident bard, and Lozef Igovich, an ice dwarf paladin. For some reason, each hero felt called to touch a certain statue. Anesson felt called to the halfling warlock Alden. Ignath felt a kindred spirit to the Luxodon monk Clench. Croft felt compelled to touch the ice dwarf paladin Losef, and lastly, Orin felt a connection to the triton bard Calicolo. Each one touched their statue and fell asleep. They shared a vision of the four lieutenants of Yarantar, fighting off the chains of Imrius. A brutal battle full of carnage and death, but just as soon as the vision began, it came to an end. The heroes awoke, now each bestowed with a power from their lieutenant. Anesson gained the healing light of a celestial warlock. Ignath gained key points from a monk. Croft gained lay on hands from a paladin. And Orin gained bardic inspiration. Not sure with what had just happened, our heroes dusted themselves off and continued further into the hideout. Eventually coming to a meeting hall, at the end they could see some sort of dark ritual happening. A sickly knoll standing over Devana with a dagger in one hand and chanting a dark incantation. 
The priest's bodyguards attempted to stop the heroes from interrupting, but with a few quick attacks and spells, they were dispatched. With just the Noel priest left, our heroes advanced. This sickly-looking Noel priest was no pushover, though. After a few grueling minutes of visceral combat, our heroes came out of the hideout triumphant and with Devana safe. But just as they crossed the threshold, Devana felt strange. A dark presence overcame her and yanked her back down into the hideout. The heroes chased after her, but were unable to keep up. Eventually, they came back to the meeting hall. What they thought was a dead end now had a human-sized hole in one of the stone walls. With no idea of what lied below, the heroes continued into a new area of the Knights of Yarntar hideout. Further down, they found a prison block with skeleton corpses garbed in chains of Emrius outfits. Even further down, they came across Yarntar's office, her corpse still in her chair, and behind her was a crypt. At the end of the crypt, Devana laid on the ground, motionless. The heroes charged in, the tombs of the lieutenants surrounding them. As they got close to Devana, a shadow of her arose from her body, attacking each of the heroes with psychic energy. This shadow creature was the strongest adversary that they had fought yet. Without any help, they would surely perish. Anessin, however, had noticed that the corpse of Yarntar had a magical aura to it and pleaded with her for help. Yarntar heard this plea. She stood up from her chair and helped defeat the shadow creature. But immediately she returned to her chair, but not before giving Anessin one of her machetes. Finally safe, the heroes started their trek back to return Devana to her father. As they entered the jagged woods, they decided to make camp for the night, to rest their body and their spirits. Once again, though, fate had other plans. Halfway through the night, a clandestine adventurer showed up, an older male with features that looked elfish, but they couldn't tell in the dark of the night. Standoffish, the heroes denied this person access to their camp and saw that he was not alone. They figured out he was a liar, the group demanded to know the truth. The stranger took off his hood and revealed that he was a vampire named Lestat, and he works for the House Tain. He has been given permission to pay the heroes 4,000 gold for the girl. Without hesitation, the hero said no and sprung into action. Lestat's companions were zombies that he commanded. Easily dispatching them, Lestat had no choice but to flee. The heroes took rest and questioned Ivana about why so many people were after her. She had no idea why and just wanted to go home. Eventually, the heroes did get her back to her father. A welcomed relief, they hugged one another in tears, and Ral thanked the heroes for saving her. The heroes started questioning Ral, though, for something seemed off. Ral excused his daughter and told them the truth. Ral's wife died while giving birth to Devana, but during her pregnancy, claimed that she was visited by a god and laid with him. Ral, not sure what to believe, decided that no matter what, he would love and raise this child as his own. The heroes agreed that their job of... Prof- Blah, sorry. The heroes agreed that their job of protecting this girl was not done and would offer their services to stop this vampire from House Tain. Croft offered his tailor shop, called the Top Notch, as a hideout till they could figure out their next plan. That night, Raoul told them about his wife, specifically how when she was pregnant with Devana, she would regularly go visit Atropos, the high oracle of Varea. After taking everyone to his shop, Croft visited a contact of his named Irwin, a dealer of poisons and acids that was staged as a baker. Croft bought some goods and tried to hear about the nefarious deeds going on in Seraph. It was there Croft heard that Lestat was just a broker hired by House Tain, and indeed one of the higher-ups of House Tain was in Seraph. This higher-up had contracted Irwin to create a new poison, using very rare ingredients that would be potent enough to kill even the most powerful of beings. With this information, Croft went back to his shop, but didn't inform the rest of the party. The next day, they went back to Rawl's shop, the Silver Hammer, only to find it ransacked and set ablaze. With no clues found, 
they returned to Croft's shop once again. When they got close, they saw a group of thugs loitering near the entrance. Walking right past them, they headed in, only to find Lestat perusing the store. In an attempt to end the threat, then and there, they drew their weapons. Before they could advance, Lestat informed them that his thugs outside were told to barricade the building and light it on fire if anything was to happen to him. The heroes sheathed their weapons and talked with Lestat, but no agreement could be reached. Lestat left them, but told them he would be seeing them tonight. Gathering Raoul and Ivana, the heroes took them to an abandoned warehouse in the docks of Seraph. With a few hours before sundown, they began building traps and moving empty boxes around to fortify the building for the oncoming assault. At night, Lestat showed up with his thugs, offering them one last chance to hand over Devana or die. Without a second thought, Ignath shot an arrow, instantly killing one of Lestat's thugs. Lestat and his men charged into the warehouse. However, with a solid plan in place, the heroes were able to finally kill Lestat. Before dying, though, Lestat landed a blow with his scimitar against Ignath permanently blinding him as he slashed across his eyes. With their leader dead, the leftover thugs ran off into the night. Needing a rest from battle, our heroes went back to Croft's shop. But one of them did not rest. Instead, Croft went back to the warehouse to get rid of any evidence. It, however, was already set ablaze. Standing in front of the burning building, Croft could see a shadowy figure. He feared the worst. The figure turned around and Croft's nightmares were real. It was Harlan, his old mentor from House Tain. Harlan offered Croft an olive branch. He wanted the girl, and if Croft would deliver her to him, Croft would be accepted back into the organization and forgiven for all his past misdeeds. For this to happen, though, Croft had to do one task. Croft had to kill Atropos, the High Oracle of Verea. Unsure of what to do, Croft accepted the job in order to just buy time. Harlan, happy to hear that his old apprentice was going to be coming back into the fold, handed him a bottle of poison, the poison Croft heard about from Irwin. The walk back to his shop was a long one, but he knew what to do. Croft had no intention of giving up Devana or killing the Oracle. He returned to his shop, but he didn't tell the group about the warehouse, Harlan, or the poison. The next day, Anessan asked around the town for a healer, one that could help restore Ignas' eyes from being blinded. He heard about an old orc druid that lived in the forest around Seraph. Anessan guided Ignath into the forest to seek out the druid, and there they met Bermud. He stood over six feet tall, with dark yellow skin and orange eyes. He didn't wear any clothes, but had moss that grew all over him. Bermud offered to heal Ignath's eyes, but only if Anessin could prove Ignath's worth. Anessin gave a beguiling tale of how Ignath had protected Devana, and even Anessin himself at times from attacks from shadow creatures, gnolls, zombies, and a vampire. With the story finished, Bermud grabbed some of the earth from beneath his feet, spat into it, and smeared it onto Ignath's eyes. He asked Ignath which weapon did this to him, and Ignath replied, a scimitar, with a few words of a druidic incantation. Ignath's eyes were healed, but underneath each eye, a tattoo of a scimitar appeared. As a thank you, Ignath hunted the largest elk he could find and harvested its heart for the orc druid. Little did Ignath know, though, that the elk was a fey creature. While that was going on, Orin visited a fellow rock gnome named Clink, a blacksmith by trade who owned the Silver Spike. After hours of constant rambling, Orin commissioned him to make a chained saddle that would anchor him to his steel defender, one that he had named Conflict-Oriented Rumble Guardian Interface, or Corgi for short. The two then spent a few hours forging iron into chains and leather into a saddle. Before Orin left, Ignath showed up at Clink's shop. He wanted to turn one of the elk's antlers into a weapon. Clink, loving a challenge, accepted the job. He was able to create a curved, serrated, single-edged short sword from the main beam 
and its backside had the tines sharpened as well. Near midday, the heroes had rejoined each other at the top notch. Not sure where to go next, they decided to visit Atropos, for maybe she would have answers for them. The Temple of Verea was located at the top of a large hill inside the Arboretum of Seraph. As they walked to the top of the hill, the winds would intensify with every step they made. To the point it felt like the winds were pushing them forward, towards the temple. As they reached the top, they were met by Zeno, a tall, well-built, light-brown-feathered Aarakocra adorned with leather armor, a dark oak wooden spear that was tipped with a greenish metal and a footbow. Zeno told them that Atropos was expecting them, but they had to wait to see her. They first must leave before they can enter. The hero stared at the temple, nothing more than a small marble platform surrounded by four columns. They saw Atropos, another Aarakocra, her black feathers mixed with light blue, wearing flowing red and green robes. Sitting in the center of the platform, talking with creatures made entirely out of swirling wind, the four creatures turned to leave the temple, and as they passed the heroes, they noticed that each creature was one of them. As their wind-like twins left the temple area, they dissipated and returned to the wind. Zeno then let them into the temple. They had learned much from Atropos, but each answer only gave more questions. They learned that Devana's mother, Gloria, had laid with a god, but none of the known gods, for Atropos had felt a powerful magic that even blocked Berea from giving her visions of who this god was. They also learned that the four of them meeting was not a coincidence, but fate had propelled them to one another. As well, they learned that they were able to soulbind with the Knights of Yarntar, for both the knights and the heroes were god-touched. But Atropos could not answer any more questions. She simply reached her hand out to Croft and asked for a drink, for she was parched. Speechless for the first time, Croft wasn't sure what to do. He hadn't planned on giving the poison to Atropos, but she assured him that it was the right path and needed to be done. Hesitant, Croft gave her the poison, and she drank it. Zeno asked them to leave. Anesson, Ignath, and Orin were confused with what had just happened. They asked Croft as they walked down the mountain what was going on. But before he could answer, they heard a scream from Zeno, a wailful dirge. Orin, being curious, ventured back up to see the lifeless body of Atropos being clutched by a crying Zeno. The rest of the heroes had questioned Croft, but still stunned, Croft couldn't give them any more answers. The heroes knew one thing for sure, though. They had to get Ral and Devana out of Seraph and somewhere safe. On the walk back to the top notch, the heroes had come up with a plan. They would buy a passage for Rao and Ivana to the city of Fendon. There, some of Anesson's elf clan would escort them to the city of Umbral, where Ignath's orc clan would offer protection. Rao, not sure what to do, accepted the offer. Croft Ignath and Anesson took them to the docks and found a smuggler willing to offer them safe passage to Fenden. Orin went back to them more often than not to close out his tab. Drekus, the owner, another rock gnome who wears a blue colonial jacket trimmed with red that matches his fiery hair, saw Orin and immediately pulled him into the back. Drekus informed Orin that some chains had come around asking about him and his companions. They even started putting up wanted posters around Seraph. Orin immediately drank a potion of disguised self and went to find his friends. Finding them near the top notch, Orin informed them that they should be careful where they go. Croft took them into the back room of his shop and they laid low for the night. While everyone was asleep, Croft decided to sneak out and find Harlan. Much to his surprise, Harlan was already waiting for him outside the shop. Harlan congratulated Croft on killing Atropos, and now he wanted the girl. Croft lied to his old master and said that he would deliver her tomorrow morning. Harlan thanked Croft for his service and welcomed him back into House Tain. That night, Croft barely slept. 
In the morning, the heroes decided to take the fight directly to House Tain, for maybe the one person who would give them answers was their leader, Lyric Tain. Orin crafted a few more potions of disguised self, and Ichnath casted Pass Without a Trace. And with that, they went to the docks to find passage to the city of Cork. There, they came across a beer-bellied halfling, wearing a crimson red pirate attire. That shoebuckle was his name, and the smiling devil was his ship, and he assured them that he could get them to Cork without the chains or any authorities knowing. But they had to make a stop at Asima first. They agreed and sailed away from Seraph. On the journey to Asima, the heroes had finally been able to rest. It was on the first night when they had slept that they once again had a vision of the Knights of Yarintar. But this time, they weren't fighting chains of Imrius, but fighting monsters, vampires, werewolves, and skeletons. When they awoke, they had slept the entire trip, all three weeks. As they arrived at Asima, they saw why it was called the City of Ships. For Asima is just a small island surrounded by thousands of ships. Each ship tied and docked to one another, creating a city of ships. The small island in the center had a lagoon that only Tritons were allowed into, for in it was the true city of Asima, home of the Tritons. While drinking in the Howling Cutlass, a tavern ship within Asima, an orc named Kosk approached them. Seeing Ichnath, he recognized him as he was from the same clan, the Red Jaws. He had asked them for help, for he took a contract to hunt a bronze dragon named Felgolos, for Felgolos had been terrorizing the local trade near Asema. The chance to hunt a dragon was a rare one, so the heroes accepted. They rented a ship and convinced Thatch to captain it with a few of his crew to help. Before leaving, Orin stopped by the mermaid's servant, a notable alchemist in Asema. Orin bought multiple barrels of goblin exploding jelly, with hopes it would help them take down Felgolos. They sailed away from Asema to Felgolos's lair, which was a few days' journey away. On this journey, they had come up with a plan. They would stick Corgi onto one of the ship's dinghies with the barrels of the exploding goblin jelly. Anessin would cast an illusion on it to make it seem like a very fat seal, a bronze dragon's delight. Once swallowed, Corgi would activate the goblin jelly, exploding it from within. Ichnath also prayed to Rastus, the goddess of elements and chromatic dragons. He asked for a favor for himself and his companions in the coming fight. Rastus heard his prayer and granted them a boon of accuracy. But her evil twin, Mastus, also heard this prayer. When they arrived at Felgolos' lair, they enacted their plan. Anesson cast his illusion spell and attempted to bait Felgolos into swallowing their trap. Felgolos came screaming out of her lair, and much like a great white shark, she breached the water from underneath and swallowed the dinghy hole. The heroes underestimated the size and power of Felgolos. Her bronze scales were shined to almost a mirror-like quality. They bounced the rays of the sun off each scale, intensifying it. Her pale, sickly green eyes were unnerving to look at. She was not a young dragon, but a full-sized adult one, standing well over thirty feet tall, and her wingspan extended out well past forty-five feet. Her claws sharpened, her teeth glistening with saliva, and with each one of her breaths, you could hear the crackle of electricity. Her eyes focused in on the heroes and their boat and started to charge towards them. But her efforts would soon be thwarted. Corgi was now inside the belly of the beast and bit into the explosive jelly, setting it off. With a forceful, loud blast, fire came spewing out of Felgolos's mouth. It was not enough to kill her, though. The heroes sprung into action, launching harpoons at her and pulling her closer to the ship. Even in her weakened state, she was no pushover. She fought to her very last breath. And with that breath, she prayed 
to her father, Mastis, asking for power to vanquish her enemies. Mastis, angry at his sister and the heroes, split open the sea floor beneath the boat, and the molten metals of the earth came rising up from this fissure towards Philgolos. The molten metals seeped into her wounds, cauterizing them and healing her, and also bestowing an armor-like protection against the hero's attacks. Even with this newfound power, Felgolos was not strong enough to defeat the heroes. She devised a plan, however. If she was to die, she would make sure the heroes would die with her. She breathed in and shot a massive lightning bolt out of her mouth, but instead of aiming it for the heroes, she aimed it at their ship, blowing an enormous hole through the entire ship. Allowing Kosk the final blow, the heroes watched as he wrapped a chain around Fogolos' neck. Using it, he swung down her body with his sword, cutting her neck and chest wide open. The damage the dragon had done to the boat was beyond repair, though. The ship was going to sink. Thatch casted out the two last dinghies, and the heroes watched as their only way back to Asema sank down into the fissure that Mastis had created. The winds and the currents of the gray ocean were too strong for the dinghies to be able to row back to Asema. With no idea how to get back, the heroes descended into Felgolus's lair. There, they found her hoard, filled with all kinds of treasures. Felgolus kept the figurehead from each ship she destroyed as a memento of her terror. Most of the figureheads had become waterlogged and soft to the touch. Anessin, however, noticed that one figurehead was still in a pristine condition. There was a six-foot-tall oak tree with gnarled branches. Anessin attempted to pick it up and noticed it was light to the touch. He swam with it up to the surface, and as he got closer, the sun rays started hitting this barren oak tree. The sun rays somehow empowered it. With each foot close to the surface, the tree became more and more alive, twisted and turning, transforming into a single mast frigate ship. The outside of the ship looked like tree bark. The deck wasn't made of planks, but solid oak, and the mast was made of a single giant oak tree. Not sure what had happened, and with no other choice, the heroes boarded the ship. They explored it and found it to be empty, and it had no captain's wheel or even an anchor. After a few minutes, a face appeared on the mast, greeting the heroes. They learned that this ship is a living treant called Beachfang. Anessin remembered hearing stories of Beachfang when he was growing up in the Malin Lost Backwoods. It was rumored that long before the decrees, when the elves were eternal, a wood elf named Dathira snuck into the chasm, stole a branch off of Galen, the god of nature and fertility. And when she returned from the chasm, the branch became the legendary ship Beachfang. Beachfang wasn't sure how long he had been in Felgolus' lair, but he knew nothing about the decrees of Emrius, so it had to be at least 300 years. Now with a fully sentient ship, the heroes headed back toward Asema. That night, however, a thick fog rolled over the ocean. So thick, the heroes couldn't see more than five feet. After hours of trying to sail through the fog, they could not escape it. Even Beachfang had no idea where they're going. It was then the heroes started to hear a lovely song. An angelic woman's voice was singing to them in a tune about a sailor who fell in love with a mermaid. As the song went on, everyone on board, including Beachfang, started to feel sleepy. By the time the song ended, Everyone on board had fallen asleep. The heroes awoke on an island, alone. No thatch, no cosk, no beach fang. A single island with a forest on one side, a swamp on the other, and a mountain in the middle. With no idea what had happened or where they were, the heroes ventured into the forest. This was no ordinary forest, for everything was far larger than it should have been. The tree trunks were more than 60 feet in diameter and over 200 feet tall. Even the creatures of the forest were far larger than they should be, and each one saw the heroes as a tasty snack. They fought a boar five times the size of normal, with spiked bones protruding from its skin, escaped from an even larger bear crowned with antlers like a deer, and carved their way through giant goats, all to get through the forest and up the mountain. 
Eventually, they found a cave entrance and decided to rest. But rest never came. They closed their eyes, but all they heard was another siren song. This one about a woman who watched her beachside town consumed by the ocean. At the end of it was a loud, screeching hiss that dealt psychic damage to the party. Unable to renew their abilities and spells, the heroes ventured further into the cave. They paid attention to every step they took and their surroundings. A winding path led them further into the mountain. Something seemed off, though, about the walls. After close investigation, they noticed the walls were not made of stone, but of hair. Dark, gross, slimy, moist, vile hair. It moved like a pit of snakes and covered everything. Every inch of the walls and the ceiling, but not the floor. Coming into a clearing, they started to notice a layer of webs on top of the hair and a giant spider looming in the dark, ready to attack. The hero sprung its trap, getting stuck in her webs. She leapt at the heroes, ready to defend her lair and the eggs. Ignath, however, noticed that the spider moved with intelligence superior to that of beasts, and through primeval awareness, knew the spider was just hungry and protecting her babies. Ignath told the rest of the heroes to not attack, laid down good berries, and asked permission to walk through its lair. The spider stopped, ate the berries, and with a scattering hiss, told them to leave. They ventured deeper into the cave, and eventually came across a very nice room. Silk carpets, various paintings on the walls, an incredible kitchen, and a bed made with satin sheets. In the middle was a fair maiden, her hair an auburn brown mixed with gold, smooth skin, a fine silk red dress, and a smile that could make any man weak. However, as she turned to face the heroes, the other half of her body showed. It was an old, decrepit hag, her skin shriveled and tight around her bones, hair that was corpse gray and eyes milky white. She told them her name was Demdike, and how she hoped her island weakened them enough that their spirits and flesh were tasty, for torment makes the body taste so much sweeter. The heroes advanced towards her, but not before her hair came alive, shooting up from the ground berating them. They were able to push through her defenses and bring the attack to her. Hexes, curses, and magic missiles came from the hag, almost killing each hero. Ignat's dear antler weapon somehow bypassed all of her defenses and struck the final blow. Her entire body withered away into dust. Low on health and resources, the heroes attempted to rest, thinking that with the hag dead, they could finally heal their wounds, but her magic still affected the island, stopping them from resting. They only had one choice, head deeper into the cave. After a few hours, they came across the hag's source of power, an open area that looked like it was carved out of the mountain. Smoothed, large cobblestones, each with a runic carving pulsating with eldritch power, and in the middle was a glass vase trimmed with gold and sapphires. This vase was surrounded by nine floating bodies, each wrapped in a cocoon of swirling water, with a water stream pouring from the cocoon into the vase. Anesson quickly went to work studying the ritual. He deduced that if each person was pulled out of their cocoon at nearly the exact same time, the ritual would be stopped and the people would be okay. They enacted this plan and they were able to stop the ritual. Thatch and Kosk were among the nine saved, but the other seven were the hag's coven. Lucky enough for the heroes, the hags were unconscious. The heroes tied them up but left one untied. They made sure Thatch and Kosk were fine and then woke up the solitary hag. They learned from this hag 
named Sidonia, that the siren hag they had killed was siphoning her sister's powers to enhance her own, and the coven was happy to have her gone. Sidonia offered them safe passage off the island, as long as there would be no more bloodshed. She took the heroes to a hidden cove where Beachfang was hidden. There she calmed the turbulent waters and let the heroes finally leave this cursed island. However, before leaving, Anessin pocketed the vase containing the essence of Demdike and her coven. It was a few days before the heroes would reach Asima. During the voyage, Ichnath worked with both Orin and Croft to craft a breastplate of Felgolus's scales. Afterward, Croft took his old tunic and crafted it into four scarves for the party. When they reached Asima, they noticed the city of ships was nowhere near its normal capacity. It looked nearly abandoned. Not sure what was going on, they got into a dinghy and rode into Asima. It was upon arrival at Asima that Croft broke the news to the rest of the heroes. He had realized he was in over his head, and he had decided to part ways with them. He gifted them each one of the magical scarves he had made. Each scarf was adorned with a dragon scale crest, etched with a trident, a bow, a spell book, and a spool of thread. Croft then gave each a firm handshake and left to find passage back to Seraph and the top notch. Not sure what to do, the heroes went to the Howling Cutlass Tavern to regroup and rest. It was in that tavern that fate gave them a new companion. They met Victorin Amberhall IV, an acquaintance of Croft, a noble from Fenden who was seeking adventure in a life filled with peril. They sat down and began talking with Victorin to see if he was worthy of joining their quest. Thank you so much for listening to The Story So Far episode of Hammered in Helios. Feel free to follow us on Instagram at Hammered in Helios or subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash HIH podcast. Also, a special shout out to Marco Ajiro for absolute banger of a song, 20 Ways to Die. Find him on Instagram at the Marco Ajiro. Our next episode releases on July 5th, which is going to be our first actual play episode. And in that episode, we review Brugladi Barley 2014. Now, let's get hammered.